So we've talked about both the learning side and the query side of the locally linear embedding algorithm. And now it's time to play with a little bit of code in a simple example. So there's a skeleton already in your Git repository. I've uh, included essentially the minimalist imports here. And in particular, there's your locally linear embedding class. Uh, we're also going to do some 3D plotting. So I've included the axis 3D class. So I'll take that. All right, so first up, what we're going to do is actually go through the process of creating a, a data set. This data set will have three different features, but the manifold within the data set is going to uh, be only two dimensional. So first off, I'm going to uh, create a, uh, essentially a time variable. And it's going to go from 0 to 10 really radians. And you'll see why I call it that here. The first feature is going to be essentially a cosine over that time variable, except I'm going to add in an extra component. We'll talk about that in a second. And the other one is going to be sine. OK, so if, there's, if we just had cosine and sine here, we would be representing circles. Uh, but by multiplying by t plus 1, we're, as time is getting bigger, we're actually going to be spiraling outward. So we're building a, uh, a spiral here. The third variable, I'm just going to pick uh, randomly. And so, so random.random gives us a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. So we now have values between 0 and 20. Actually, we can say for x in x, x0, we'll do the trick. So for every one of the elements that we have in x0, uh, we'll create an x2 that's just randomly selected. And then finally, I'm going to convert these all over to over to two-dimensional NumPy arrays. They're going to be samples by feature, each one x0, x1, x2. There's only one feature. Um, but then we'll be able to concatenate them together easily. So x0, so by putting uh, x0 and x1 inside of the brackets, we're adding an extra dimension there. Actually, we're actually getting row vectors out of this, but we'll fix that here in a moment. And then we'll concatenate all those together. And we'll take a transpose. And let's just look at the shape of that. I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but my kernel has gotten into a weird state. So we'll try loading that up again. X2 here. OK, there we go. OK, I deleted the extra couple characters that were right here. So now this should execute without a problem. And the shape that we're now ending up with is 1,000 samples by 3. OK, so first, let's convince ourselves that we ended up with a spiral. So we're going to look at the x0 and x1 dimensions here. Oops, I actually have to tell it what we're plotting. We're going to add a subplot. And we're going to do some special plotting here. This is why I'm going about this in a different way. Uh, the 1, 1, 1 here means this figure will have one column, one row, and this is the first element in that set, in that list. And we're going to use the scatter function here. I'm going to plot uh, x0 by x1. And the new thing here that scatter allows us to do is actually color the points as a function of some other variable. And in this particular case, I'm going to color them a as a function of this time variable. So uh, one end of time will have one set of colors, and then we'll have a smooth transition to the other set of time, to, to, the, uh, to the end of time. And then we also have to tell it what our color map is. I'm 
Okay, so there we go. So there's our uh, spiral. Back up a little bit, make that fit. So time t equals zero is, was right here. And then as uh, time increased, we proceeded in an orderly fashion around this spiral. And, and you can see that we're getting uh, different colors at the other end. So, so by doing things in this way, this is going to allow us to track what's happening uh, as we go through the embedding process. Okay, so this is x0 versus x1, but let's also look at the full three-dimensional feature space. And here we just have to add our third dimension, and it figures everything out from there. Oops, except we have to tell it that we are doing a 3D plot here. There we go. Sorry, I'm going a little bit too fast here. That particular property goes on the axis and not the figure. Okay, there we go. So projection equals 3D means that the in the axis we're gonna be doing a 3D plot. There we go. So, so now you can see X0 and X1 we were looking at before, so that's the horizontal dimensions. And, uh, and now we're seeing this vertical dimension here. Time t equals zero uh, sits right here. And as time increases, we're going around this, this swirl uh, out to this point. One thing to note about the distribution here is that uh, right in this vicinity here, part of it has to do with the angle that we're looking at, at, at this from. But, but within this region here, the physical density of the uh, blue points is is tighter than it is out uh, out over here. Okay, so that's our data set. So we have it's a three feature data set, and now we want to use locally linear embedding to recover this this two D shape. So essentially, what we have is this rolled up carpet piece, and what we want to do is unroll that into the two D plane. So let's go ahead and create that model. So one key property of this, of the locally linear embedding um, approach is that we get to determine what the neighborhood looks like for each of the points in the training set. I'm going to select 10 for now. And then we also select the number of dimensions that we're going to end up projecting into. So we've already structured this data such that we know that it's a 2D plane that it lives in. So I'm going to select uh, two there. And we also have to determine how it's actually going to go about solving for the weights and for the Zs. And I'm going to select in jobs equals negative one. So we use all of the available processors. Oops, and we also want to do a model.fit on our training set. So there we go. That was uh, that came back in less than a second. So I'm going to go ahead and transform our training set into the Y space and ask what the resulting shape is. Okay, so for every one of our training set elements, of which there are a thousand, we have two output features, which is what we've selected up here. All right, so now let's go ahead and look at what the distribution of these Ys is in this new compressed space. And for that, I'm just going to steal this code that we have up here and bring that down to here. And instead of plotting Xs, I'm going to plot Ys. And that should do it. Okay, so, so there we go. So what we had hoped for was a nice carpet square. Uh, we don't exactly have that, but what's important here is that the distribution of the colors is nice and orderly. So that beginning of time is, is here with the, with the blues. They're being uh, projected uh, together uh, in this strip here. And we, we, don't, we don't know this by looking at this particular picture, but these points up here correspond to uh, one end of the, of the swirl. So maybe up the top here, 
and then the other points down here correspond to the, the bottom side. So, so we're achieving some topology along this dimension here. And then as we go around the spiral, those points are being unwrapped along this dimension here. So we go from blue to cyan to, to more of a green to yellow, uh, orange, and then finally to red. And so these points here correspond to the, the points that are, that are at the very end of our spiral. Now, one good question is, why do we have this shape rather than the nice carpet shape? Part of what's going on here is that in, inside of the, on the inside part of our swirl, the blue points are more tightly compacted together. And that's in contrast to the points out on this side where they're further apart from one another. So the process of building those local models is different for the right-hand side than, than we have uh, in between and, and especially on the left-hand side. So, so that's why we're seeing a different distribution. However, in some sense, uh, we do have this nice mapping from, from our points on the original swirl into this two-dimensional space. So we're respecting, we, we're not showing this, but, we're, but we are respecting the vertical axis here and then we're also respecting the position along the swirl uh, a long time. And so one could actually imagine trying to learn a, say a linear function over the points in this space here and compare that to a linear function over the points in this space here. If this additional variable that we were trying to predict was linearly related to where we were in the vertical and in the horizontal, then we could do a reasonable job of, of actually learning that model. If we have our x0, x1, x2, if we tried to learn a linear function over those three features, then we would not do a very good job of actually capturing uh, the, the function that we wanted to represent. So you'll get a chance to play with that in your homework assignment. Okay, so th let's play for just a moment with uh, with our parameters here. So let's push number of neighbors down to six and see what happens. And, and here you can see things have become even more distorted. So there's still some amount of respect for, for the topology of the coloring, but that started to break down. Let's go down another two, go to neighbors of four. All right, so at this point in time, four neighbors is not actually enough to connect all of the points in the training set together, just based on those neighborhood relationships. And, and so we've now uh, ended up in this very strange uh, space where it's trying to respect distance metrics when there are no distances between some of the points. Okay, so, so there is a limit to the number of neighbors. Let's try uh, going in the opposite direction. So pushing the number of neighbors up to 20, we end up with more of a carpet type shape, at least for the first half of the spiral, but the rest of the spiral is sort of compressed into uh, this small strip right here. And that's starting to happen because to get 20 neighbors for any of the points out over here, one has to look over a very wide area. If we push this up even higher, that, that effect will become even more uh, distinct. All right, so here now we've started to uh, overlap our parts of our carpet into uh, the same uh, regions of this uh, Z space. So, so the point here is that there is a sweet spot for how many uh, neighbors that you would want to select. And in the more general form, where you, when you have more than three dimensions of input uh, into this uh, particular algorithm, uh, you also have this question that you have to answer with how many components you want to have in, in your model uh, as on the output side. And, and so these two things end up becoming hyperparameters that one has to, uh, to actually consider. Okay, so that's, that's a simple example of using locally linear embedding. You'll play a little bit of, with this in your homework assignment, and in particular, play a bit with learning functions uh, over the uh, new space.
Uh, and uh, next up, we're going to try uh, another example with locally linear embedding with a bigger data set. <laughs> 